I have a pro tip for you guys today. If you ever find yourself at the emergency room, but you're in a hurry, you don't have time for things like, you know, triage or signing in or I don't know, waiting with all those other suckers or just waiting. What you want to do is you're going to show up like by 7 a.m. at the latest. The earlier, the better, okay? And then when you get there, you just like crumble to the floor and just collapse and like curl into a ball. It's really efficient. Um, like, in, like, I'm sure there's other ways that are also efficient. But as a mother of two boys, I've had my fair share of uh, emergency room visits. And this approach has proven time and again to be the most efficient way to get uh, seen. Now, I guess it, maybe it helps. Like I had said two boys in tow at Caleb, who was, it was like a couple days before his 10th birthday. And Charlie, the baby, is not a baby anymore, but like. And he's like three. Uh, and at the time, I was so angry they were there. Like, I'm pissed. I'm so mad these kids are here. Like, not because they're being crazy and rambunctious or running around the ER or anything like that. Or like, if they were, I don't know. I couldn't see them from my vantage point on the floor. Um, but because I had tried to get to the hospital by 630. That was when I really wanted to get there. But somebody, <clears throat> my husband, Dan, insisted on driving me to the hospital, which I know you're like, well, that seems like an appropriate thing for a husband to do. Uh, but yeah, that required, what do we have to do? We have to wake up the kids, to get the kids dressed, we have to get the kids in the car. And all those things sound like they would be really quick unless you're in an emergency situation and they're nine and three. Like that, that doesn't happen. So Dan's like, no, it's not going to take that long. It's going to be really quick. Like, all right, well, your idea of really quick and my idea of really quick are probably very different at this point because you haven't been doubled over in pain on the floor for the past five hours. So back up a little bit. Um, I was like four hours into like being violently ill and, and collapsed on the floor at home, not in the hospital yet. Um, and, and I decided, you know what, I should consult the medical books and see if this is something I should be concerned about. Like, we have a surprising number of medical books. Because, like, we got married and started having kids at the turn of the century. And I don't think we had internet then. So, so I know all my books. So I, like, crawl downstairs and I get to um, to the bookshelf. I pull up book one. And based on my symptoms, it's like, you know, you should seek, a medic you should seek emergency care like, immediately. Well, that seems drastic. Uh, so book two is my Kaiser Permanente Healthwise Handbook. So I used to work for Kaiser. As an HMO, they're, they're usually like, mm, don't come see us all that much. Uh, and they said the book followed suit, and the book was like, Meh, maybe give us a call. I was like, all right, well, that seems very different than advice number one. So I consult book three is the tiebreaker, and that one has like a big you know, red triangle and exclamation points. So it says, yeah, emergency care. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know. It's like still in the middle of the night. Everyone's asleep. I don't know. Maybe like it's just indigestion. I'm being dramatic. Like, when were these books written? Oh, yeah. I mean, they're at least 10 years old. This is like this last century. Clearly, uh, medicine has changed in the past 10 years. I need, I need new, more recent guidance. So I, I fancy myself quite the internet doctor. Uh, so I go to the Googles and I ask Google. I say, hey, Google, do I really need to go to the emergency room? And Google's like, yeah, Karen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you do. You do. And then like backs that up with like pages and pages of websites that are like, also, not only do you need to go to the emergency room, like now, if it's been like four hours or more, it could be too late. Like I'm a ticking time bomb. Oh my God. All right. So I, I crawl back upstairs and wake up my husband. All right, Dan, can you call her neighbor? I think he leaves for work at like the next five minutes. Just see if he'll drop me off at the hospital on the way. He's like, no, that's ridiculous. I'm like, no, no, no. It's like total. it's on his way to work practically. He's like, no, honey, I'll do it. I'm like, no, like <sighs> we lent them sugar last week. This is a totally neighborly thing to ask. This is fine. He's like, no. So here we are an hour and a half into like the ticking time bomb that is my life curled up in the fetal position on the floor of the hospital. But, you know, we got there by seven, so it's fine. We're still, still good with our plan here, right? You got to get there early. So no, no triage or waiting for me. Dan's still signing the guest book up front, and they, like, scoot me off the floor and, 
you know, bring me to the summer. I think I had an IV in my arm before I even got to a hospital bed, which was nice because I was, it was a lot of pain. Uh, so Dan leaves. He's got like, we've got kids still, right? So he's got to take Caleb to school and Charlie, the baby. Um, so somewhere we had to take Charlie somewhere, literally like fast forward to now. We've been talking about this for weeks. We can't remember where we took the baby. <laughs> no idea. Like, I feel like I have a good excuse, right? I was in the hospital. I'm fairly certain he didn't just leave him at home with like some Cheerios on the floor and the Disney Channel on, but nobody can really say with certainty because he can't give me an answer about where he took him. So that's where we are. The kid's at home with the Cheerios. I'm in the hospital. Uh, where were we? Okay, uh, medical tests and Sue. No surprise maybe to everybody. Uh, my appendix was very angry. And they were like, mm, we're going to have, we're going to take out your angry appendix. You're going to have emergency surgery today. Like, okay, cool. Uh, they got to do this like IV drip of, of uh, I, what is it, antibiotics or something for like, we got a couple hours. Well, that's good. We have time. Because uh, Dan's phone's about to die. Uh, he doesn't have a charger. Very ill prepared. Like, you know, if my neighbor had taken me. You could have done all these things. Fine. Um, and we got to figure out what to do with the kids. Like, it's getting late in the day. So he's got to go, you know, what are we going to do with Caleb after school? Somebody's going to make sure Charlie still has Cheerios. Um, so he leaves. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, my mom's coming soon. I'm kind of in and out of consciousness. Well, time flies when you're in and out of consciousness and you're having fun. Uh, and before I know it, they're like back in my room. They're like, all right, you're next on the appendectomy docket for the day. Let's go. Prep for surgery. And they're like, wait where's your loved ones? Do you have any? Like, oh, no, you left. He'll be back soon. They're like, yeah, we prefer to wait until you have like a loved one before we put you under for surgery. You guys do this all the time, right? I'm like, yeah, hey, yeah, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. But you know, like a loved one, you should have a loved one. I was like, well, okay, well, he'll be here soon. We tried calling. I don't think his phone made it to a charger, so we couldn't even get in touch with him. Right. I was like, well, listen, there's precedence for this. Can we just wait? Like, go take somebody else's appendix out. And come back to me. The precedence to this is almost 10 years to the day earlier when I was in labor with the almost 10 year old and the doctor comes in at 4 p.m. She's like, you are ready to have a baby. And I was like, no, my husband gets off work at five. I'm going to hold this thing in. She's like, OK, <laughs> that's never happened. But sure. So she goes and delivers another baby. And I'm like, if I can hold in the baby for an hour, I can totally hold in this appendix. Got this. Like, all right. So, and that was fine for like the first one, but like the third or fourth appendix that they had to take out that wasn't mine, <laughs> they were like, no, we're going to really need to do this. <laughs> okay. Well, luckily, like, thank God my mom shows up um, right when they'd run out of appendices to take out besides mine. So we, we collectively decide Dan is not making it. And my mom's my loved one. I say my goodbyes and go into surgery. So I wake up. Um, I don't know if anybody's had like anesthesia. Uh, like people wait, have different reactions. So like some people get really mad and they yell and some people get like feel sick. I cry like a lot, <laughs> like uncontrollable, ugly sobbing. And I'm like, I'm so sorry, I'm crying. And it's like a whole show and it's really embarrassing and ridiculous. Um, so I have my meltdown post-surgery and they wheel me to the recovery room and yay, Dan showed up. He's there. <laughs> he made it. I survived. It's great. Uh, and then I think he left again. Like, like if somebody had to go get the kids, I wasn't going to do it. So he goes to get Caleb from a friend's house. I remember that we did that. And Charlie from... Like, so I keep thinking it's going to come to me. It's not. We don't know where we got it. But we got Charlie, too. So they come back to the hospital to, to see me. And, like, Charlie had clearly not been adequately exercised during the day. So he's, you know, three-year-old running around the hospital. My mom's trying to chase after him. He's, like, pushing buttons and pulling on cords and general three-year-old chaos. And my nine-year-old looks at me and takes one look and bursts into tears. Like, you know, me and my altered state, I'm like, did he have anesthesia too today? That's weird. What's wrong with you? And, and he's just tears streaming down this little face. And he goes, 
I thought you were dead. Oh my god, right? Oh my god. Like I didn't even occur to us with all that was going on. Like what that must have looked like to a nine year old. I go like play it back. All right, we woke him up in the middle of the night, rushes his mom to the hospital, she collapses on the floor, they hook her up to all these scary machines. And then we're like, all right, say goodbye to mommy. <laughs> Off to school with you. And then like radio silence for 12 hours until he shows up and sees me. And we're like, oh my God. I mean, we just like talk about heart wrenching. We felt so, so bad. So bad. So, you know, we console him and assure him that, you know, I'm not dead. I'm going to make it. Just missing enough. It's fine. Everything's fine. And Dan gives him a hug and he turns to me and goes, you know, in hindsight, Maybe having the neighbor take you wouldn't have been such a bad idea. <laughs> I was like, you're right. You know what? Because like then Caleb wouldn't have even known I was at the hospital. He'd just been like, I got to go to my friend's house and play. And I got junk food for dinner. Oh, how's it? <laughs> mm-hmm.